the three horns uprooted by the 11th, an exploration into the Seleucid allegory of Daniel 7. Oops, that was okay. too quick. Okay. Okay, that's good. Batar Dana, Haze, Haveit, Behezve, Lelia, Ba'aru, Heva, Rivi'a, Dehila, the Imtani, the Takifa, Yatira, the Shinayan, D, Harzel, La, Ravraban, Achla, Umadeka, Ushara, the Ragla, Rafsa, the He, Mishanya, Min Kol, Hevata, D, Kadmaya, the Karnayan, Asarla. That's the Aramaic of this first verse from Daniel 7. After that, as I looked on in the night vision, there was a fourth beast, fearsome, dreadful, and very powerful, with great iron teeth that devoured and crushed and stamped the remains with its feet. While I was gazing upon these horns, a new little horn sprouted up among them. Three of the older horns were uprooted to make room for it. Then I wanted to ascertain the true meaning of the fourth beast and of the 10 horns on its head and of the new one that sprouted to make room for which three fell. And the 10 horns mean from that kingdom, from that kingdom, 10 kings will arise and after them another will arise. He will be different from the former ones and will bring low three kings. So the next slide. I'll tie the next slide. Okay, great. So our approach to this problem, we're going to explain what the problem is about this text from the book of Daniel and the Bible, and we'll give an outline of our solution. And then uh, we're going to be discussing rumors about the violent deaths of the three predecessors of Antiochus IV, and we're going to try to defend the legitimacy of three co-ruling kings who will make up three of the ten kings that we're going to propose as a king list underlying this text. And then we're going to talk about the 11 horns in the broader context of the, the, the delegit, I can't say the word, delegit, delegitimating of Antiochus. Okay. So here's the problem. This vision of a giant beast with 10 horns the last three of which were uprooted by the 11th, has puzzled biblical and historical scholars for over two millennia. It is largely accepted that the Ten Horns are an allegory for the Seleucid lineage. Likewise, uncontested is that the 11th horn stands for Antiochus IV, under whom the cult of God in Jerusalem was effectively banned. But no previous commentator has been able to present a consistent identification of the Ten Kings preceding Antiochus in the dynastic list, or to decode the ideological messages implied in this, okay? So our, our possible solution is, we think that there is a clear-cut solution. If we say that all the legally co-ruling kings of the dynasty, of the Seleucid dynasty are included, based on this principle of counting co-ruling kings, a coherent list of 10 Seleucid kings that predeceased Antiochus IV can be drawn up. This revised list enables us to better understand the ideological distortions of the author behind Daniel, who, as we'll explain in a second, uh, the author or authors behind Daniel were, was a contemporary or were contemporaries of Antiochus IV and V. Okay. So while the biblical book of Daniel consists of stories purportedly about and visions supportedly granted to Daniel, a Judean courtier who lived in 6th century BC Babylon, modern critical scholarship has demonstrated that at least the second half of the book, Daniel chapters uh, 7 through 12, was written in the 160s BCE. We put in that at least because what Altai and I are working on um, is the idea of that Daniel 1 through 6 also at least went through an edited version uh, in the 160s, even though there's certainly earlier material there. Um, and that is something that we'll be working on in the future. What is the book of Daniel about in general? As a whole, it addresses a theological problem. 
if the Jewish God is all powerful, the universal God, and the Jewish people have such a great destiny, what, what went wrong? Why have they been living for centuries at this point as subject, subjects of a succession of empires? Here they are in the 160s in a time of crisis, the persecution of Judaism by Antiochus IV. And so these visions are brought at this particular time, right in the middle of the crisis, to show that everything that has happened in the past and is happening as part of God's plan is told by angelic messengers 400 years earlier. So since all of the events that are so-called predicted have already happened, they are taken as evidence since all of those things were predicted and they happened, all these other things that are now in the future will also happen. So as a kind of proof of concept of what we're talking about, um, we turn to another text within these chapters. While we're talking about Daniel 7, Daniel 10 through 12 um, are another text, perhaps by the same author, perhaps by a different author, but certainly around the same time. And you just see here all of the Seleucid kings that are mentioned uh, by this writer. That is, in, um, in, in Ele Daniel 11 is not like anything else in the entire Hebrew Bible. It is a kind of universal history, or at least a history, a Hellenistic history. Um, and it, with great specificity um, and detail, is mentioning or referring to or alluding to, in a not very cryptic way, all of the kings. So if we have, I think if I'm counting right, eight kings here, these are already eight of the 10 kings who we are proposing, or seven of the 10 kings that we're proposing will be part of the hidden king list that we are suggesting is alluded to uh, by the idea of the 10 horns, okay? So just to step back for a minute and think in general about king lists, they are primarily political documents more than they are historical documents. They sequence succession and claim or disclaim continuity. They legitimize or delegitimize a particular ruler or dynasty. They express a present or an intended reality. And if we find in them divergences from historical facts, as scholarship understands those facts, they are normally not mistakes, but windows that allow us to see the intentions of their authors. Divergencies are always show the intention of the author. Each entry on each list has to be evaluated for its own political or historical implications. Okay. So, obviously, for a long time, people have been trying to reconstruct, you know, who are the 11 kings. And lots of scholars have come up with very ingenious and very intelligent um, uh, lists of who are the 11 kings. Um, we find certain problems with all these previous uh, reconstructions, including the idea that they'll include Alexander the Great or they'll include Ptolemies. But as I tried to emphasize when I was reading the text, it said, from that kingdom will come these 10 horns. So Ptolemy VI or Alexander certainly were not Seleucids. Um, a lot of the reconstruction, reconstructed lists regard Demetrius I as the 10th king, but he was, uh, he was uh, not a predecessor of Antiochus IV. He would rise to power only after the successor of Antiochus IV, his son Antiochus V, was killed in 162, which is after these texts. So he, and he cannot be one of the three kings uprooted by Antiochus IV. Uh, many of these king lists avoided co-kings, and that's one of the things that we're going to be arguing for strenuously today. Um, why did they, uh, and when, when you say many king lists, not only reconstructed king lists, but ancient king lists, um, or ancient list, uh, king lists that were embedded in other kinds of texts. Uh, many of these king lists avoided co-kings who died prematurely, wh or whether their composers found them insignificant, wanted to obliterate their memory for one reason or, no or another, or more generally rejected the ideology that emphasized the continuum of a shared yet indivisible Seleucid royalty since 312. Think about the whole idea of the Seleucid era, which is trying to show that con continuum, that continuity. 
Um, in Daniel 11, they talk about all the Seleucid kings as the kings of the north, as if they're one king. Um, so there are these attempts to show this continuity. Some lists don't want to show that continuity. So we, however, include these three, that the third horn, of the, we'll see, show this better on, on a, one of the next slides, Seleucus, son of Antiochus I. Um, and go back one second, Altai. Um, uh, the eighth horn we're going to try to show was Antiochus, no, one, one, one forward, uh, uh, thank you, son of Antiochus III. That is the eldest son of Antiochus III, who died prematurely for reasons that we'll try to discuss. And then the tenth horn, the boy Antiochus, son of Seleucus IV. Okay. Um, so our reconstructed list looks like this. And on the next slide, we'll show what we're really arguing about. That is, one, two, four, five, six, seven, and nine are not up for discussion. Eleven is Antiochus IV. That's not up for discussion. Everybody accepts all those as part of their list. Um, the three that are controversial and that we're going to be trying to make the case for are numbers three, eight, and ten. Okay. Um, and all, uh, and, and there are three of these uh, uh, kings who died under dubious circumstances. Dubious circumstances can lead to rumors, especially if you're trying to slander somebody, as, as these contemporary Judean texts are going to try to denigrate, uh, denigrate Antiochus IV. And the three who died under dubious circumstances happen to have been the last three um, uh, who may have been the three who were uh, alluded to as, as being uprooted by Antiochus IV. Again, 8, 9, and 10, An Antiochus, son of Antiochus III, Seleucus IV, and the boy Antiochus, son of Seleucus IV. Okay, so now I'll, I'll tell it to you. You have to unmute yourself, Alton. Okay, there you are. Thank you, thank you Ben. Yeah. Uh, so I was just uh, saying that this is still the opportunity for you to ask a question if you could not follow part uh, of the argument. Um, so especially those who have joined us only recently. And then perhaps uh, can can you keep an eye on the participants list? Uh, what I've been trying to do, because someone may be knocking on, and I it may I will, I will. Yes, I will do. Yes. So, if no one um, is raising her or his hand right now to to ask a question, I will dive into the second part, which is a lot of prosopographical research rumors about the violent deaths of the three predecessors of Antiochus IV Epiphanes and defending the legitimacy of three co-ruling kings. Now, um, here we see the same list again, and uh, I basically repeat what is on my plate. I want to establish first that three um, co-ruling kings, namely number three, number eight, and number 10 um, have to be included into the count and that they were, that they truly existed as kings and enjoyed royal status. Um, and further, do I want to um, uh, establish that the last three of them died under dubious, at least, uh, circumstances and that it is uh, feasible, if not plausible, to at least spread rumors that Antiochus IV Epiphanes was behind their deaths. So let's start with number three, Seleucus, son of Antiochus I. Greek and Babylonian inscriptions attest to this king, Seleucus, as co-ruling from 280 or 79 to 266. So his historical existence is, uh, is not doubted, um, but uh, there is a controversy as to whether this, um, well, this co-king towards the end of his life um, revolted and was therefore put to death by his father Antiochus the first, first and replaced by his younger brother Antiochus the second, or whether that is simply a rumor. This is important for our question because if he did revolt 
and was executed. He would have fallen into illegitimacy and we should not expect him in an official king list of the Seleucids. So he would then be disqualified for our account. Now, traditionally, um, since, uh, well, the, the pioneers of Seleucid uh, scholarship, uh, Bevan and Bouchier Leclerc, um, the, uh, late, uh, the later um, Roman sources or uh, Byzantine sources have been trusted. Um, however, it creates quite some complications. Um, some, uh, well, more recent um, uh, pieces of scholarship um, that uh, pursue the question um, show actually how difficult the assumption is that Seleucus truly revolted against his father. I refer to Daniel Ogden, who I would have loved to see amongst us. He has registered. I hope he may still join us. Um, so uh, his, um, his uh, uh, contributions to Hellenistic dynastic history are um, very valuable. And um, most of you are familiar with the, the term of amphimetric strife a category or um, that he introduced into Seleucid scholarship to explain many um, many um, dynastic struggles uh, where brothers, half-brothers try to kill each other. However, here, I think the amphimetry uh, strife theory does not really work plausibly. It assumes, um, and uh, Daniel tries to argue that um, Seleucus, um, the son and Antiochus the second were from two different mothers. That to me um, seems very unlikely. An appointment in 280 would be very unlikely from a different mother than Stratonike, the, um, the wife of um, Antiochus I, since 294. So she, he would, they would have had a teenage boy, and taking um, the son from any earlier relation would have been extremely unlikely in my view. Um, and Jeremy Clément, in a very recent article published in Historia, um, tries to reconstruct um, a very speculative line of events and uh, a political geography, which um, I think have many suffer from very many problems. I can't go into details here, but if anyone is interested, I might come back to it in the discussion. But I only point out these examples to show as soon as you try to go into details to to put this, um, this allegation onto a historical map, you really run into problems. But what are the sources for the, um, the claim that Seleucus revolted against his father? So um, the most famous and um, uh, explicit source is that of John of Antioch in the seventh century CE. Antiochus, after whom a city in Assyria is named, had the son Seleucus and Antiochus, the one with the cognomen Theos. But after Seleucus had been suspected to plot against his father, he was killed. Okay, uh, so here we have an explicit um, reference, even though it's very late. But I'd like to emphasize that um, John of Antioch does not, uh, does not really attest to a revolt that had happened, but rather, to the suspicion of revolt as the motivation for a dynastic murder, or at least as an explanation for the death of a young king um, who, well, who did apparently not buy, die in battle. Um, we have a second literary source much earlier, early first century, um, the, um, uh, well, Pompeius, Pompeius Trogus, though unfortunately not the original, but only the later prologi. Um, how King Antiochus with the cognomen Soter died in Syria after the one son had been killed and the other Antiochus acclaimed king. Now here, we do not have an explicit um, uh, well, statement that Seleucus was uh, convicted of usurpation and therefore executed by his father. Though I admit that the author may well have thought and the full text may well have had this allegation more explicit. But again, it is more an assumption um, that is uh, expressed here than something that, uh, well, that has, that is more substantiated. 
But there is more. There's actually a third literary tradition, again, very short. John Malala's also Byzantine, fifth century, but he speaks only in a subclause of Seleucus, who died young. No reference to his uh, violent death. And uh, in fact, the dying young um, references the mos immatura motif, the motif of early death of actually, uh, uh, this, this implies compassion and mourning and is very, is hardly compatible with the tradition um, of an execution. So uh, at least we should, uh, we should accept that there were in the later literary tradition, there must have been two competing traditions um, as to the death of this not well known king. So we have more evidence and more evidence that actually questions um, the assumption of uh, his execution. Uh, most importantly, a Babylonian inscription of fifth up of the year 46 of the Seleucid era, which roughly equals the 14th August of 266 BCE. This inscription names Antiochus the great king before, and I quote, his son Seleucus and Antiochus, kings in the plural, both of them had the royal title at the same time. And Giovanni del Monte already in 1995 came up with a very conclusive idea that um, Seleucus seemed to have suffered of a terminal illness uh, and uh, therefore got his brother as a co-appointment perhaps to support him. Um, and uh, we have sort of a smooth transition. Of course, there is some speculation in this explanation as well, but I do think it's much better compatible with the evidence, and I'm not alone. He, Del Monte is also uh, followed by um, Savali Lestrade, by Gillian Ramsey, and by John Holton. Um, the evidence is admittedly a little bit more confusing and inconsistent, so I don't want to uh, be silent about some further inconsistencies. There is one inscription naming Antiochus, that is the future Antiochus II, as the co-ruling son as early as in July 268. Is it an error or not? We cannot know. There is little um, supporting evidence because there are two slightly younger inscriptions, uh, one from Asia Minor from Laodicea at the Lycos, and another one from Babylonia, which only mentions Seleucus, that is the older brother, as the co-king in 267. So there is some um, unclarity. We, we know that uh, often some inscriptions were not up to date, that sometimes information took, uh, well, the latest information of di uh, dynastic news were not received, sometimes for months, if not longer. Um, and, and errors did happen. We do not want to insist um, on um, a very, well, uh, on an explanation for each of these pieces um, um, of information or each, each of these documents, um, but we want to emphasize that Del Monte's theory remains by far the most convincing. I move on to number eight, Antiochus, the son of Antiochus III. It is somewhat easier to argue his case because there, is there are tons of inscriptions and also many literary references to him. He ruled for, uh, for nearly 17 or 18 years um, and uh, was quite an active figure, so he did leave many traces. Um, I here only quote um, the entrance of the Babylonian king list um, from the 102nd year until year 119, Antiochus the king and Antiochus his son were kings. There is no indication in the Babylonian evidence that um, Antiochus the son would ever have become illegitimate through usurpation. Um, and uh, there is actually posthumous evidence um, and uh, the most authoritative of this evidence is a priest list um, or actually, uh, more specifically, the title of the dynastic cult of Seleucia in Pieria, composed under Seleucus IV. So he remembers his brother, Antiochus, the son of Antiochus III, in the 
god list um, of the dynastic priest. So this is a strong piece of evidence um, for us that he died as a legitimate co-king. But there is a very strange murder allegation. I quote from Livy book 35, he had already shown such revelations of himself that it was clear that if longer life had, had been his fate, the character of a great and just king would have been his, namely Antiochus the son. The, the dearer and more pleasing he was to all, the more did his death cause a suspicion that his father, believing that such a successor following close upon his old age would bring discredit upon him, had through the agency of certain eunuchs, removed him by poison. They even furnished a cause for his secret crime, that he had given Lysimacheia to his son Seleucus, that is the future Seleucus IV, his younger brother, but he had not had a similar capital to bestow upon Antiochus, that he might banish him far from his presence, even while conferring a mark of honor upon him. Now, how plausible is that? That is such a weird concoction. Um, uh, so imagine a father who in his own right was extremely <laughs> successful, for sure the most successful after the founder King Seleucus I. He's supposed to have been jealous um, of his oldest son who was prospering um, and uh, well, who was promising to have a strong continuation of the dynasty um, of the Seleucids. Um, and the fear was that the glory of Antiochus III might be obliterated only after the death of this long ruling king. That is extremely unlikely. And it's quite ridiculous, the next bullet, that the assignation of Lysimacheia, a relatively insignificant city um, in southern Thrace, to Seleucus, his brother, the later Seleucus IV, who did not yet have a royal title then, that this might have been a disadvantaging of Antiochus the son. We know that in the 90s, the operations of Antiochus the third and his second son, Seleucus, shifted towards Western Asia Minor and even Thrace, and Antiochus was about to, to enter Greece and thought potentially even conquer Macedon. But he had, uh, well, he had assigned Antioch, that is Syria, and with this also uh, Babylon and uh, all the Eastern satrapies to Antiochus the son. What a mark of distrust and distinction uh, and how ridiculous it is uh, to, um, to assume that Antiochus might have been jealous of a brother who did not have the royal title. And then further, the um, murder of um, this son Antiochus, um, Yeah, is supposed to have happened early in 192. We now have um, where the date is established, I think, for February or March uh, 192, um, very briefly uh, before he was um, sailing over to central Greece to, to start a big war. Uh, he was hoping to win the war, of course, but he lost against the Romans. But is it imaginable that he would weaken his, his own dynasty in his own back by having his son executed, his son who was holding his place in all loyalty back in Antioch. And then we have the stereotyped um, incrimination of eunuchs who are always good for all kind of slander. So really, this has very little trustworthiness. And most scholars, as of Boucher Leclerc, not all, but most, um, actually rejected this um, murder allegation. Um, so we fully agree with this negative assessment uh, um, so far, but we do want to make the point that there was slender at some point. We do not know how far this slender goes back. the whole 
Okay, so number nine, Saint Lucas the Fourth. Um, I've just mentioned him as the second, uh, as the brother of um, uh, Antiochus. So I speed up a little bit. This king is well known and basically quite known as little spectacular. His rule known as very little eventful until he died, probably by murder in 175. So I do point out one. A uh, fine detail, namely that um, he became co king only in 189, not immediately after the death of his brother. So I think that is um, a neat indication that the huge mourning or the, the, the deep felt mourning um, of the death of his brother by his father was quite honest rather than for show as uh, Livy claims. So that is actually part of an argument that I add to my previous point. And I now look more closely at the murder of Seleucus IV. Now, we have one clear indication of this murder in uh, Appian Sy uh, Syrian book, second century CE. While Antiochus was returning, released from his position as hostage, namely hostage in Rome, um, uh, and that is Antiochus the fourth, um, to be clear, uh, and he was still near Athens, Seleucus died as the result of a conspiracy of Heliodorus, a member of the court. But Eumenes and Atalos drove away Heliodorus, who had seized power by force, and they settled it on Antiochus, gaining his goodwill to their cause. Because of some quarrels, they now looked with, uh, with distrust on the Romans. Thus Antiochus, son of Antiochus the Great, became the master of Syria. I have gone a little bit over time. So basically I skip um, the reference to two Maccabees, which is interesting in its own right, but uh, has a different tradition, which has a very smooth tradition uh, of power with no murder allegation, um, but it's not very trustworthy and it's, it's highly construed. Um, but the takeaways of my unit on Seleucus the first is the following. So a violent death of the ninth legitimate Seleucid king is quite possible with Appian, even though not firmly proven uh, because there is no near contemporary evidence, nothing in the epigraphic material. So the circumstances of his death for sure are very suspicious um, and uh, the the murder who is named the murderer who is named by um Appian Heliodorus, um the leading courtier, uh, well he also raises many questions because we cannot really see a good plan for him. Why would he why would he um actually do that without seizing the throne for himself? Um and uh, we neither know exactly what happened to him when Antiochus uh, reached the court. So it's all quite opaque. Uh, but one other point, and that is perhaps the most important I want to make in the context of the broader argument, the timing is quite weird. Antiochus IV was just back from Rome via Athens on his back, uh, uh, on his way back to, to Antioch, and that is when the murder happened, and that is when the Athenians and when the Pergamenes were ready to give him support to bring him back to the kingdom that was owed to him, even though Seleucus IV had two sons, one hostage in Rome, Demetrius the first, and the other a boy king of around five years. So that does raise suspicion, not least because Seleucus IV himself was still young, was not involved in a war. Again, reason for suspicion is there, and uh, Antiochus might have had, had, had his hands in this game. I come to number 10, my my, uh, my last unit, so King Antiochus, son of Seleucus IV. None of the main literary sources, uh, well, Polybius is Lacunos here, but Livy and Appian seem to have even known about the existence of a younger son of Seleucus IV who might have become the effective successor of Seleucus IV. Neither have the Judean sources any knowledge of him, even though 
um, the Judean sources are often our most detailed um, evidence for what was going on in the Seleucid dynasty in the um, in the second century. Um, so the immediate succession of Antiochus the fourth was not only is not only attested in the the Appian source that I've just read out to you, but it's also confirmed in an inscription, namely an inscription from Athens that uh, was praising not directly the Euergetes um, uh, of theirs, namely Antiochus the fourth, who had spent some time in Athens and built up a very positive relationship, but rather other benefactors of Athens, Eumenes and Atalos of Pergamon. Um, and uh, so their role in the succession is spelled out here. So Seleucus having died and the situation being inviting. So the text is a little like you know here, but it becomes clearer from now on, if only we add as the subjects Eumenes and Atalos. Observing that the moment offered an occasion for doing a favor and a good deed, and as far as the borders of their own kingdom, they advanced together and they furnished him, namely Antiochus IV, with money and provided military forces and adorned him with the diadem together with other regalia as was due, uh, as was his due. They worthily restored to his ancestral realm, King Antiochus. Well, we all know that they were not very altruistic. They had been at odds with Seleucus IV and were quite happy to have a friend, someone working closely with the Romans and with them. Um, so uh, they certainly had their own stake in that game, but nothing of that is in the Athenian inscription. However, I'm quoting it here because it doesn't make any reference to another king, namely Antiochus, son of Seleucus IV as the successor. So did he exist? Actually, he did, um, but uh, biblical scholars um, and uh, historians of older times um, did not know about him and just took for granted that the succession as he explained as theme in, shore, um, in Appian is accurate and also as, as um, uh, two Maccabees had it. But Daniel 11 is at odds with it because this uh, well, cryptic but contemporary text portrays Antiochus's accession as a gradual one that had required extended political strategy. Um, and uh, this Daniel reference has always been regarded as completely accurate, uh, inaccurate and then uh, was any trust. However, in recent years with um, our um, grown understanding of the numismatic and epigraphic evidence from uh, Bab Babylon, um, a son of Seleucus IV named Antiochus is accepted as the immediate successor. There is, um, um, even though the evidence is a little complicated, but uh, the catalog of Houghton, Lorber and Hoover um, lists at least eight different types and in, in some count, uh, in some count it's up to uh, 11 um, and uh, from uh, at least four uh, for, from three or four different months. And uh, they show a child king, a boy king named Antiochus, um, and uh, partly even together with his mother, Laodike. What do Houghton, Lorber, and Hoover do? They take the epigraphic evidence for the death day of Seleucus IV and for the accession day of Antiochus IV, as attested in Babylonian inscriptions. And then they date all the numismatic evidence for the boy king into that little time gap of some two months or so. We don't think that this is warranted. Um, and uh, we would rather think that uh, this boy king played a much bigger role or at least um, uh, held the title of king much longer, probably until his murder in 170. And uh, it's uh, although we understand that Antiochus IV started minting early, though we don't know how early, let's be clear that the first era dated coinage of his dates to 169.68. We are sure that he started minting earlier 
but it's very difficult. Um, and I do think that uh, some dye studies would be warranted here to shed some more light on the succession of the coinage. I have three examples to show you. So one beautiful portrait of the, the boy king uh, based on which um, he is, uh, uh, well, um, expected to have been around five years in 175. Um, I didn't get um, uh, um, online a good picture of uh, Laudike, his mother. Um, the, the important point is that this coin, uh, well, is, has the legend uh, in his, in the legend, the name of King Bas uh, uh, Ant Antiochus, Basileus Antiochus, and this may be one of the first representations of um, uh, a queen, of a Seleucid queen ever. And also um, the boy king, it's the first representation of a child king um, amongst the Seleucids. But here comes the highlight. It's a Jugate portrait, a well-known um, uh, coin type uh, showing the two Laodike in front um, uh, and the boy king uh, behind. I add one slide um, that allows you to compare the, the portraits of the king, and we feel um, that uh, there might well be an age gap imp uh, implied in the two portraits of a couple of years, which would support our suggestion that we should give much more than only two months to the whole series of Antiochus um, uh, the sun uh, coinage. Now, um, a little bit more. What do we know about the death of this king? Well, there is literary evidence for the murder of the son of Seleucus. Um, first, in um, or a more general reference in uh, John of Antioch, uh, mentioning that Antiochus um, the fourth killed a son of his brother Seleucus and places the responsibility for the murder on others whom he also killed. This is quite vague, but actually a good summary of the much more detailed account in Diodorus. So that is pretty early, um, mid first century BCE. And in that account, um, we read about Antiochus I, um, Andronikos, who assassinated the son of Seleucus and who was in turn put to death, willingly lent himself to an impious and terrible crime only to share the same fate as his victim, meaning that he got executed in due course. Now, there is some indirect support, which is even earlier in two Maccabees, which does not mention this boy king, but it does mention Andronikos and even Andronikos as a murderer of a just man, namely Onias III, the, high, the deposed high priest, and even fabricates uh, well, this is a fabricated murder story, um, but uh, interestingly, Antiochus the the fourth is shown in this account as someone showing compassion, being still a good king, and killing this murder Andronikos. Only afterwards, he turns into a haughty, arrogant uh, king who attacks um, the the cult of Jerusalem. So we, we have quite good evidence for the murder and uh, we actually have better evidence, but since I'm running a little bit um, over time, I skipped the unit on the uh, Babylonian inscriptions. I might resume it in the discussion if there is interest, but that on the one hand proves and even dates the accession of this young king and also of his murder, um, even though it adds some further complication to the whole story. So I skip these and my conclusion for um, King number 10 is that, um, well, he was a child king um, effectively, an effective child king means that he held the title of Basileus, that someone at the court ruled in the name of his king. Um, partly it must have been his mother shown depicted on the um, on uh, on coinage and also I think attested in epigraphy. Um, we have clear evidence uh, that Antiochus was behind the murder which uh, of this boy king, which happened five years later um, in 170. And we can actually um, 
we can actually uh, make um, uh, some learned suggestions about his motivation that was at a time when Antiochus was fully established as a king, when he had perhaps some military cloud of his own after repelling the Ptolemaic invaders into Syria before he was campaigning into Egypt himself in 170. And so as a further conclusion, we have actually rehabilitated Daniel, um, uh, although his source is quite opaque, obscure, and polemical, he's drawing on very precise information here. So my mission is accomplished. I have shown that kings number one to 10 were legit legitimate kings, all worthy of inclusion into a king list. And further, that number eight to 10 died under dubious circumstances. And I would like to add one further point for those who still who are still skeptical whether or not um, co-kings might be included into such a list. I think my point about the murder um, of Antiochus, the son of Seleucus the, the fourth, is so clear cut that um, he clearly must be the last horn that was uprooted, and uh, uh, but he was a co-king. And uh, also the case of Antiochus, son of Antiochus the, the um, third, uh, was a co-king, but fits so well into the list of the three uprooted horns. Now, admitting this, that we really need two co-kings at the end of this list, um, we should also be consistent and include uh, our number three, Seleucus, son of Antiochus the first. So thank you for your attention for the second part. Before I pass on to Ben, this would be an opportunity to ask matter of fact questions or if anything that doesn't open a big debate yet. I don't see a raised hand. I don't see anyone just trying to say something. So Ben, would you want to? So I, I can do this next part pretty quickly um, because what, what Altai has said is in reference to the Daniel text, um, but one of the key verses um, is 1120, uh, where um, that, that is where um, it says, V'amad al kino nivzeh, and, and what will, who will stand up after Seleucus IV will be a spurned prince. Um, and so the, one of the key things here is we're trying to establish, just to go over it, that Antiochus IV is said to have uprooted three kings to make room for himself. And so, it, so what Altai uh, tried to substantiate is that um, it could be taken that Antiochus IV was involved in the deaths of those three that he's uprooting, or just simply that he is taking their places. That is, Antiochus, the Antiochus, son of Antiochus the third, would have been the guy we would call Antiochus the fourth. Um, Antiochus, son of Seleucus the fourth, would have been Antiochus the fourth if he hadn't been killed. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, so, uh, okay. So, as a spurned prince living in exile, the future Antiochus the fourth may have planned his path to power. I'm going over what uh, Altai was talking about. It is possible, and this is, you know, I'm very into conspiracies, so this may be pushing the evidence, but with some combination of the help of his Roman captors, their Pergamene allies, and possibly certain ministers of Seleucus IV, the prince, that is Antiochus IV, may have plotted, but certainly capitalized on, at least capitalized on, the assassination of Seleucus IV to become co-king or regent with the dead king's young son in 175. That is, um, and I'm not sure that Altai stressed this, that it may be in that period, Antiochus IV did have a role. He might have been a co-king. He might have been a regent. He may have actually effectively had the power, but the titular head still was Antiochus' son uh, of Seleucus IV. So in a not so cryptic style, Daniel 11, 21 through 23, really, state that before his rise to power, Antiochus IV, son of the late king Antiochus III and brother of the current king, had been scorned 
and he had not been given appropriate royal honors. That's what the ver uh, 1121 says. And that this rejection, among other things, besides ambition, may have motivated him to avenge himself and rise to power by killing those who had scorned him. Antiochus IV was originally named Mithridates. He was, the, just to go over this, he was the principal hostage in Rome mandated by the Treaty of Apamea from 188. And so he was there from either 188 to 178, or, or as I think, 188 to 175, and was released in exchange for Seleucus IV's oldest son, Demetrius, at some point in those years. If he did not return to his home, but stayed in exile, that is, if Seleucus IV didn't call for his brother to come home after he was released from hostageship, the scorning is evident. He had not been invited back to Antioch to play some important role. If so, he was rejected by his older brother, who did not give him such a role in ruling the Seleucid kingdom. Okay. And so, um, so now I'm just going over verses, not only in ele chapter 11, but also in chapter 8. Um, a king will arise, impudent and versed in intrigue. He will have great strength, but not through his own strength. That is, Antiochus IV did not become full king, sole king in 175. And here we have two different texts within Daniel that are, that are alluding in not very cryptic or opaque fashion, but in pretty clear fashion, I think. He didn't have his own strength. He will have great strength, but it's not his own strength. He will not have the title of sole king, but he is, he is versed in intrigue. And in a parallel passage a few chapters later, his place will be, that's the verse I was talking about, his place will be taken by one who is spurned, in whom royal majesty was not conferred. He will come in unawares and seize the kingdom through trickery. Okay, next slide. Um, and he is a usurper. He will be extraordinarily destructive. He will prosper in what he does and destroy the mighty and the people of holy ones. The forces of the flood, including the prince with whom he made a compact, who I maintain was Antiochus, uh, son of Seleucus IV, uh, this prince with whom he had made a compact, will be overwhelmed and broken by him, okay? By his cunning, he will use deceit successfully. He will take great plans, he'll make great plans, he will destroy many, taking them unawares. All of this is this process that probably took five years for him to rise to, to, to the sole kingship. Um, and by the way, I don't think Altai mentioned, when he killed the, uh, the boy Antiochus, son of Seleucus IV, it was after he had his own heir, his own son. And from the time an alliance is made with him, he will practice deceit and he will rise to power with a small band. That's a pretty bad translation. The Hebrew is bim at goy, with a small nation. Uh, he will, I'll come back to that in one sec. He will invade the richest of provinces unaware and will do what his father and forefathers never did, lavishing on them spoil, booty, and wealth. Okay. And so, uh, this is something that I published on. I, I take Bim Ad Goy as uh, the, what I call the Milesian Connection, a reference to an old movie called The French Connection, that he has a number of people, and I'm going to skip through this quickly, um, who are all uh, from, from one small nation, all of whom I think were part of his cabal, uh, I want to call it his, part of his small band. And Daniel 11.24 speaks of how Antiochus IV gives bizarre booty and power to his small group of uh, allies. I think there's a play on words. The Nivzeh, the one who is scorned, who has no honors, is now giving out bizarre spoils and honors. He who was despoiled distributes the spoils to his men, but he needed to make all of these alliances. He didn't have the power. And so he had to grab the power gradually through intrigue and by giving bribes, etc. All of these verses in Daniel 8 and 11 describe and allude to the gradual, treacherous, and violent process by which Antiochus became the sole king, okay? So, as part and parcel of the uprooting, Antiochus IV, born Mithridates, son of Antiochus III, chose a name in order to replace the names of his older brother Antiochus and his nephew Antiochus, son of Seleucus IV. Either of them, this is what I was saying a minute ago, would have been the king we would have called Antiochus IV. But the latter's very choice of name uprooted their names, and very successfully, so successfully that history 
has really forgotten mostly about those two Antiochi. Antiochus IV not only took the name of his older brother and the throne of his two older brothers and nephew, he also marry, may have married his second brother's wife and his nephew's mother. He may, and this is something that I talked about at a previous conference, may have taken over his older brother's heroics in the Battle of Panion. Uh, Polybius explicitly rebukes the claim that he could have had a role in this at his young age. That is, Antiochus, the older son of Antiochus III, was the hero of that battle, not Antiochus IV as we know him, who would not have probably even been there. He thus, Antiochus IV thus, wiped out their existence really successfully and retrospectively corrected the Seleucid king list by taking its eighth rather than 11th position. So coming back to the whole idea of 11 horns at all, it, it, this author in saying there are 11 horns is saying, no, 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 Antiochus IV, you're not the eighth king. You're the 11th king, right? And you uprooted three guys to get here and you uh, uh, and you usurped the throne. So that is the whole idea of 11 horns at all is a polemic against Antiochus IV, okay? So our conclusions are, the author of Daniel 7, a contemporary and knowledgeable and alert observer of Seleucid dynastic matters, must have known many facts, and by the way, would have known many facts, um, and rumors about the deaths of Antiochus, son of Antiochus III, Seleucus IV, Antiochus, son of Seleucus IV. A denigrated account of Antiochus IV could easily slander him as the triple murderer of his own king. These kingdoms, these victims yielded the three uprooted horns of the fourth allegorical beast. Whoever was thus describing the Seleucid king, kingdom in its entirety as the sum of its rulers had to be persistent and include co-ruling kings, official representatives of the dynasty since the days of the founder king Seleucus I. The author behind Daniel accepted this inside view on Seleucid kingship. Okay. The author behind Daniel did not do so out of respect for the Seleucids, anything but, but rather because it allowed him to illustrate even more impressively the sheer limitless perversion and destructive drive of Antiochus IV. It wasn't enough to brandish him as the fiercest of all persecutors of the cult and traditions of Jerusalem. He also had to grind and trample him. Uh, uh, he also said that he grinded and trampled down neighboring kingdoms and did not even spare his own family or even his own gods. 